Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to English class for CUET. Uh, now, by now you must be aware about CUET in detail. And you know that English is one of the main subjects that you are not only CUET, whatever exam you are going to appear for nowadays, you cannot do without English and that too proper formal English, right? We will be starting with there are several topics to discuss. Uh, last day, uh, I gave some briefing about what are the types of questions that you will be asked. Chiefly, English language can be divided into three parts. Okay, we use different words for them, but chiefly it can be divided into three parts. And the first one is vocabulary. Now, you can categorize vocabulary into different categories like we have antonyms, synonyms, spelling test. Spelling test that is also a part of vocabulary because you need to know the correct word. Homonym, uh, whatever or the use of foreign words and expressions, whatever you say, all these form part of the vocabulary. Okay, whatever name we might give but the broader category is vocabulary. So, if we know the word, obviously we can talk about synonym, antonym and everything what not. Okay. So, basically we need to know about the word. And then comes comprehension. Regarding comprehension, I have to say that this is chiefly reading. So, I suggest make reading a habit. I suggest make reading a habit okay because reading does not come in a day now you can say that we know how to read we all are english medium students i agree you are english medium students but most of the times what i find that you remain confined to textbooks so only textbook english is not going to help you you will have to read varieties for that, I suggest read newspapers. And magazines. At your age, start this thing at this tender age. Okay, without losing time. And don't, don't think that now we have already passed class 12, so why, what is the need to waste time? Nothing has been lost. Start reading even now. Read newspapers, read magazines. Never ask anyone which newspaper to read. Because often you get a reply, you ask which newspaper to read and you get to reply that you need to read Hindu. Not necessarily. Yes, Hindu is a good newspaper. At the same time, Indian Express, that is also a good newspaper. The Asian Age, that is also a good newspaper. All these are good newspapers. And you all know about the Hindustan Times and the Times of India. Okay. So, any newspaper that you can lay your hands on that you are interested in reading. Now, the next question comes, what to read in a newspaper? Never ask this question. Look for your field of interest. What are you interested in? Just question yourself, read that. Often you will get a reply when you ask what do we have to read in newspaper, you get a reply that you have to read the editorial. Yes, editorial is good. We must read editorial, but at the same time, it's not that the rest of the newspaper is rubbish. So read things that interest you most. Those interested in sports can start with the sports page. Those interested in politics can read news articles uh, related to political events, political developments and all that. Make sure that it becomes a variety reading, not a single type of reading. It shouldn't be a single type of reading. Regarding magazines, I would suggest that either digital or the sprint one, whatever you feel comfortable with, subscribe one or two magazines. That is must. And from uh, the language point of view, I would suggest that instead of reading India Today and Frontline, they are good magazines. I don't say that they are not good. They are very good magazines. We must read them. But uh, if you happen to read 
Reader's Digest. It's a very good magazine. Okay. And in this, you will find writers from various countries. That means you will have command over various types of writings. So in future, you won't have difficulty understanding English language that you read. This is my suggestion and please take it very seriously because this is for the first and the last time because once we start with the topic, I'm not going to turn around. Then I would suggest novels. Now you can say that we do not have time to read novels. Who says you do not have time to read novels? You have time for Facebook, you have time for Twitter, you have time for all those things. You have time for hell of the social media. You have time for all the rubbish in the world. And I often get a reply that since we are students, we don't have time to read novels. Normally, it is considered that reading novels is a wastage of time. Sorry, please forget it. It's not wastage of time. It's most productive. I say most productive. Start with it, then you will find the change within yourself. Okay, when you start marking the change within, then you will come to realize that what a great thing this is. So all these makes your reading part. So do a lot of reading as much as you can. Okay. And I say this because comprehension is chiefly about reading. If you have the reading habit, you read, that means you can read and understand. If you can read and understand a written piece, that means you can answer the questions as well. That is what comprehension is all about. Okay. Then we have a segment that is grammar and this becomes the most important part because no language goes without grammar. If you want to learn the language correctly, if you want to use the language correctly, you must have mastery over grammar which we often tend to ignore. Now, you study grammar right from your childhood. I don't say that you do not. All of you do. Okay, and uh, to quote something, often we start with tense. In every class, we start with tense and we end up with tense. Okay, so only tense is not English grammar. There are a hell lot of things in grammar that we need to know. The correct grammar. Now, there are no formulae, no tricks in grammar. Please remember, grammar is concept. Is chiefly concept based. Okay. Now, how you have to work on your vocabulary? Let me tell you, we talked about comprehension. This part would be covered if you develop a reading habit. Now, how you got to cover your vocabulary? Whatever you read, gather five words a day. I do not suggest more and do not mug up the words gather five words okay just five words look for the meaning in the dictionary either in the print edition that is the hard copy or the in the digital form whatever form now while looking for the meaning do not go word for word try to comprehend the meaning in detail okay Read the entire explanation that is given about the word, including the origin of the word. And that is why I suggest only five words a day. So if you happen to master five words in a day, in the fashion that I tell you, there is no looking back. And please remember, five words a day is not less, though it sounds less but it's not less. Five words a day means uh, 150 words in a month. Right? Calculate on an year basis. Calculate for two to three years. Now, to tell you the truth, a good English speaker or writer, he has a collection of on an average six to seven thousand words. If we consider R.K. Narayan a good English writer, a good writer in English, if we consider R.K. Narayan as a good writer in English, his vocabulary 
ranged from 6000 to 7000 words only okay so if you happen to master five words a day it won't take much time reaching that limit of 6000 words even if you have those 6000 words you cannot remember those 6000 words every time because it is so assumed that there are two compartments in our brain one is for active vocabulary and another is recognition vocabulary active vocabulary that means while talking while speaking while writing the word automatically comes to your mind it comes to your pen it comes to your tongue that is active recognition is though while speaking or writing you are not instantly getting that word but when you listen to it when someone else speaks and you listen to the word or if you happen to read something then you recognize the word you know the word it's not that you do not know you know but it strikes your mind after either you hear it or you see it that is recognition that means you have been in a position to recognize it so that is the recognition vocabulary so the words are divided almost 50 50 into active vocabulary and recognition vocabulary now suppose there is a word in the active vocabulary which has not been used by you for a very long time then it is pushed into the recognition part recognition chamber and if you happen to read something when you happen to recognize a particular word that particular word comes to your active memory and this cycle goes on the stale words in the active one is pushed to the recognition part and those in the recognition part the moment they get refreshed they are pushed to the active part so now just think for yourself is five words a day less no in my opinion i think so but it's difficult to master even five words a day. I say five words a day, just five words a day. And I say that even this would be difficult to master. Why? Look for five words a day for a week. And at the end of the week, just try to gather those words. And you will find that you would be in a position to only gather 50% of them. 50% already out. So even five words are not less. Please remember. Okay. And then comes the most important. We will talk about vocabulary, antonym, synonym, everything. Okay. We will talk about in detail. But first you start your exercise. You start working on it. Then it would be interesting for us. Similarly, comprehension. We will talk about comprehension. Because chiefly in the class, a teacher need not tell you how to understand a written passage that you have to do on your own understanding should be your own teacher can at least pull out the hidden meaning teacher can at the best uh, teach you to understand or how to read between the lines okay there is no trick that i can pass on to you that this is the trick that can make you understand the written passage no, please forget it. There's a truth. Okay, so start your reading habit, then it would be interesting for us working on comprehension. So for the time being, let's start with the grammar part, because grammar part is quite exhaustive. We will have to do a lot of work regarding grammar. Okay. Now in grammar, we start with a topic which I name as structure of sentence. We will talk about the basic structure of a sentence. Now, I demand your full attention. Okay, I would be a bit slow. Don't worry but you need to be attentive a slight slip and the things would be gone structure of sentence we are going to understand very basic things regarding 
the structure of a sentence. Suppose I write a very small sentence that is Hari writes a letter. And now from now on I won't be doing much talking only I would remain concentrated to the subject. When you come across a sentence, the very first thing that you have to do is to mark the word in your mind. When you come across a sentence, the first step is to mark the verb in a sentence. And if it is a formal sentence, there is bound to be a verb because without a verb, a formal sentence cannot exist. Am I clear? Let me be very precise without going into much talking. First thing, recognize the verb. There must be a verb in a sentence because without a verb, a formal sentence in English cannot exist. Now the next question, how to recognize the verb? Usually, verb is an action word. Usually verb is an action word. I think you would be in a position to get the meaning of action word means words that show action, any kind of action. Action you can relate with this like we say eat, play, dance, sing, etc. I think you can mark such words that such action words are verbs. Now, there is another category of verb, okay, which we name as be verbs. And the list is, is, am, are, was, were, be, been, and be. Okay. Then there is one category of verb. Have. Now, this is also, count, also counted in the category of B verbs. This has, have is also counted in the category of B verbs. Then, we have another verb that is do. Again, we have a future indicating verb that is shall and will. And apart from this, we have one more category that is modal verbs. And you all know what these modal verbs are, can, could, may, might, should, would, ought. So now practically all these verbs, they are placed into the category of B verbs, including the model verbs also. Let's talk about these categories one by one, which is very important. Now, for any verb, we know that a verb has four forms. That is present, past, past participle and present participle. Okay. So, let's talk about these different forms of the verb. Different forms of the verb. Present. Past. 
then we have past participle and we have the fourth category that is present participle. This is what you name as the first form, the second form, the third form and the fourth form. Now, from now on, you should stop saying V1, V2, V3 and V4. Do not number it. Call those verbs by their names. That is present, past, past participle and present participle. Suppose we have a verb that is we have a verb go. The root verb of any action word, if an action word is a verb, the root verb is considered plural in use. So, go is the root verb word which is considered plural in use and if we use want to use it with singular subject then we add s or es to it and it becomes goes. Right? Past form is went there is no difference there is no different forms singular or plural for the past we have a single form past participle is gone and present participle is going now the past and past participle forms of the verbs may have different forms but present participle of any verb is made by adding ing to the base form. For present, to obtain the present participle form of a verb, we need to add ing to the base form of the verb. <clears throat> so, this goes for every verb. Now, this is for action word. Now, let us talk about B verbs. We made two categories, action word and B verbs. Now, in B verbs, if we consider present form, there would be two forms in the present, that is singular and plural. Now, for B verbs, in the past form also, we have two forms that is singular and plural. And in the past participle form, we do not have any other form. A single verb is there, single word is there and in present participle also a single word. Now, in the present form, the plural form, the original verb is B and in the present, its singular is also B. B is the root verb. In the past, the singular form for B is was and the plural form for B is were. Do not be amazed. You must have studied about 2B. Okay, we always say 2B, 2B. So, actually the verb is B. This is the root verb word. This is the past singular and past plural form, was and were. Past participle form is been and present participle as I said is always formed by adding ing to the base form. So, let us add ing to it and being it becomes the present participle form. Now, what happened? In modern writing, in modern English, so this B was quite prevalent, the use of B was quite prevalent in old English, but in modern day writing, 
the writers they started avoiding the use of be and instead some new verbs took their place. Now the singular form in the singular form be was replaced by is and in the plural form this was replaced by are. So this is and are they are the forms of the verb be only. The root verb is be. So in modern writing these were the replacements for be. But for the subject I we had a special verb and that is am. In old English be was used with I. I be the monarch of all that I rule. I be the monarch of all that I rule. That is what in modern English am replaced the verb be and we say I am the monarch of all that I rule. Clear? So let's not be amazed. And so that is why in the list of be verbs I wrote be as well as is am are was were been and be. So all these are forms of the verb be. So the root verb is be and all these are different forms of this verb be. Then I wrote a verb have. Now for the verb have in the present form have is the plural form because this is the root verb word and in the present the singular form is has. In the past we do not have two different forms. We have a single form that is had and is in past participle also it is had and for present participle we add ing to the root verb and root verb is have so we have added ing to the root verb word to make its present participle form. Now we are left with the verbs shall and will. Shall and will since they are future indicating verbs therefore they do not have any other form they do not have different forms. Similarly the model verbs that I mentioned, they also do not have different forms. No singular, no plural, nothing. So shall, will and the model verbs, they have a single form. They do not take any other form. We talked about one more verb and that is do. Do is basically an action word. And as an action word, we know that do is the base verb word which is considered plural, does is singular use, past form is did, past participle is done and present participle is again doing nothing, adding ing to the base form of the verb and base form is do so we have added ing to the base form right. So these are the different forms of the different verbs that we talked about. Now we will talk about some typical use of or different types of use of certain verb words starting with have. Let's see in how many ways in how many meanings this verb have can be used. Discussing everything one by one, which you need to be attentive and you need to retain all these things, keep in your mind. And if possible, I would suggest that if you take out a notebook and if you write down these, okay, that would be fantastic for recapitulation later. You can have a quick glance because uh, we cannot store everything in our mind, in our memory. We need references. So it will work then. Uh, anyway, otherwise I will try that this same page, if possible, 
the same page is sent to you in PDF form or in some other form like you have other notes. The only difference would be the other notes are typed one which you must have got. Okay, I think I uh, made it available. But this grammar part, the only difference would be that it is not typed, it would be handwritten. Okay, so now let's talk about the different use of the verb have. I write a sentence, I have finished my work. I have finished my work. See, I have used the verb have at the same time I have used an action word finished. Finish is an action word and finished is the past participle form of the verb finish. Okay. Now, when the verb is used in this way, this is termed as auxiliary. And this is termed as the main verb. Now, how do we name it as auxiliary or main? Main means principle, you know. So, please remember, any action word appearing as verb in a given sentence is always considered the main verb or the principal verb. I hope you will remember this that any action word used as verb in a sentence is always considered the principal verb or the main. Now, if there is any other verb used with that action word in a sentence, then apart from the action word, action word is the main verb and those other verbs that are used with that action word they are termed as secondary verbs and that is what is auxiliary, the word auxiliary that we have used. This means secondary. So one is primary, the others are secondary. For example, if I write a sentence, Hari works hard. Now, hurry walks. This is an action word. This has been used alone. An action word in a sentence is always considered the main verb or the principal verb or the primary verb. That is what I have written. Now, if I write, hurry is working hard. Now here we have used is. By now you know that is is a verb which is the form of be. We talked about it right now in the last page. And working. This is a form of the action word. The present participle form of the action word work. And as I said that in a sentence the action word is always considered the main verb. So here working is the main verb. And whatever other verb has been used with this, this would be termed as auxiliary. Now, there can be more than one auxiliaries in a sentence because there can be several verbs. There can be at the most four verb words in a particular sentence. Okay? Whether the verb is in active form or in the passive voice, whether in the active voice or in the passive voice, the maximum number of verb would be four in any given sentence. And by sentence here I mean in any given clause. We will talk about it. 
so there can be more than one auxiliaries for example hari has been working hard Hari has been working. So, working is the main verb and whatever other verbs, we know that has is a verb, we know that been is a verb. So, whatever other verbs are used, they would be termed as auxiliaries. So, any action word used as verb in a given sentence is the main verb, the primary verb, the principal verb and all other verbs that are used with that action word, they are termed as auxiliaries, right? Now, what happens right from your childhood, you read the list of auxiliary verbs as is, am, are, was, were, all these are auxiliary verbs. You are into practice of this, that they are auxiliaries. No, rather we should say, these are the verbs that can be used as auxiliaries in a sentence. Permanently, they are not auxiliaries. For example, if I say, Hari is a boy. Now, if you say that is, is always auxiliary, that means here in this sentence, we would have to term this verb as auxiliary. Can we? There can be an auxiliary only if there is some main thing. Okay? There should be some principal object so that the others become the secondary ones, the auxiliaries. Now, in this sentence, we have a single verb word and therefore, this is the main verb. This cannot be termed as secondary. If we say this is secondary, then who is the primary? Isn't it the question? So, let's remember that if a clause contains a single verb, be it an action word or a be verb, if it contains a single verb, that single verb is bound to be termed as main verb and not auxiliary. Therefore, is, am, are, was, were, permanently they are not auxiliaries. Is this much clear? What is main and what is auxiliary? Now, let us get back to our point that we were discussing. The sentence is, I have finished my work. What is the role of this verb have here? Here this verb have is without any meaning. It had just been used to define the structure have does not carry any meaning of its own. So, this has been used, have here has been used to show perfect tense. What is the intention of using have? What is the role of have in this particular sentence? This has been used to indicate that the tense form used here is present perfect. Had it been past perfect, we should write I had finished my work. That would become past perfect. So, a perfect tense is formed by placing a past participle after a form of the verb 
perfect tense is formed you all know this because you study too much about tenses so you all know that perfect tense is formed by placing a past participle after a form of the verb have any form can be there it can be has it can be had it can be have so if we place a past participle after a form of the verb have then the tense form becomes perfect if it is perfect present perfect we use has or have if it is past perfect we use had we will talk more about tenses in detail but uh, this is my belief that you at least know this much okay we will talk about the tenses what you do not know and what you need to know this present perfect and past perfect and present perfect continuous and past perfect continuous and future perfect these simple forms you all are aware of now so have here has been used to show perfect tense so here it is indicative of perfect tense now i write some other sentence i have a gold chain i have a gold chain now here we have used have alone and since have appears as a verb alone therefore in this sentence it won't be termed as auxiliary here it is the main verb clear we talked about it in the last page now here the tense is not perfect the tense is simple present here the tense is simple present and when we have used this in the simple present it's clearly visible now you can see for yourself that here the verb have carried some meaning and what is that meaning that is position okay so instead of have i could have used an action word that is own i could have written i own a gold chain i could have written i possess a gold chain so own possess they would be the verbs and they would be action words but instead of those action words we have used another verb and that is have and here have is equivalent to own or possess so here have carries a meaning of its own and here it shows possession see the difference i have finished my work have has no meaning it's simply there as indicative of perfect tense but the moment i say i have a gold chain have carries a meaning of its own and the meaning is this is showing position clear now one more sentence i have a bad cold i have a bad cold don't you see the meaning is somewhat near as i have a gold chain means that is there with me similarly if i say i have a bad cold that is also there with me only but mark the difference this is pure possession but here this is not like possessing something owning something okay but this is somewhat near to possession not pure possession but it nears and therefore by grammarians this was named as that have here shows near possession
have here shows near position. We will need all these while talking about tag questions that when have has been used in the sense of position, how to put a tag, then if it is not in the sense of position, then how to put a tag. We are going to differentiate it that way when we talk about tag questions, which is important. Now, let me write one more sentence. I have my breakfast early. I have my breakfast early. Now, very clearly you can see that here have though it has been used alone, this is the main verb, but it neither shows pure position nor it is near position. When I say I have my breakfast early, what I mean is I eat my breakfast early. You can very comfortably replace this have with this action word eat without making any difference in meaning. It can be, have can be replaced by eat. You can well say that I eat my breakfast early. And anyway, in formal English, using the structure, sometimes we say that I am having my lunch. We often say I am having my lunch. But in formal English, this must be avoided. If you want to use having, then you should better say, I am eating my lunch formal. Don't say I am having my lunch. That won't be considered formal use. Okay, you might wonder listening to these things. But this is what formal language is all about. So I have my breakfast early. This is neither position, not near position. This we call as other than position. This is showing other than position. Other than position. Right? Now, these are the different uses of the verb have, how the meaning changes, just mark for yourself and then we can use it in one more way. If I say, I have to leave early, I have to leave early. Now, the sentence written is, I have a gold chain. Actually, we are talking about the different uses of the verb have. Uh, before this, I said, I have finished my work. When I say, I have finished my work, have does not carry any meaning of its own. Actually, this has been used as an indicative of the perfect tense. And uh, just if you can afford to do it, just go on writing down because the statements that I am uttering actually these are masterpieces. Uh, the summary you can say, which takes a long time for these things to be concluded. Uh, have any form of the verb have followed by a past participle makes a perfect tense. Okay. If it is in the present form, it is present perfect and if we use the past form of have, then it becomes the past perfect. So have does not carry any meaning of its own here. Here it has been used as indicative of the perfect tense. Now, let's see the other uses of the verb have. When I say I have a gold chain, when I say I have a gold chain, you can see that have has been used alone as verb and the moment it is used alone, so obviously this is bound to be termed as main verb and when have is the main verb, here it carries 
a meaning of its own which you can feel for yourself. When I say I have a gold chain, I mean to say I own a gold chain, I possess a gold chain. That means have carries a meaning of its own here and that meaning is possession. So in this sentence, have has been used to show possession. Here this shows possession. Similarly, when I say I have a bad cold, now this is also something that I have that I possess, but this possession and this possession, they are different. This is pure possession and this is near possession, okay, though I have it, but this is not something that I own and therefore in grammar it was termed as to show near possession, means here have shows near possession. So how the meaning of have varies as we use it in different sentences. See the next sentence, I have my breakfast early. Here also I have used the verb have alone, that means have is the main verb, but you can feel for yourself that have neither shows possession, neither it is anywhere near possession. So neither possession nor near possession. Here it is other than possession because here it does not mean possession, it means this action word eating, I eat breakfast. You can very comfortably replace have with eat and the same sentence can be written as I eat my breakfast early. So this is one way that we use have. So which shows other than position. In grammar it has been termed as showing other than position. Now when I say I have to leave early, see the another use of the verb have. When I say I have to leave early. Here also we have used have alone, that means here also it is the main verb and it is followed by an infinitive. We will talk about infinitive in detail, but this much you all know that to followed by uh, the base form of any verb. Uh, so I have to leave early to followed by a verb that is termed as infinitive, this much you all know to eat, to sleep, to drink, to play, to dance, to sing, etc. Similarly, to leave. Now here, have is neither possession nor near possession. Here it has some other meaning and what is it? It shows urgency or obligation, okay? Means it is equivalent to saying that I must leave early. Means I am under obligation to leave early. So here it shows urgency or obligation. So this is how have has been used. So please keep in mind the different meanings that have carries and how it is used in different sentences to convey different types of meanings, right? Now, in the list of B, we had written an action word also and that action word is do. Do is pure action word. You can see for yourself, I do everything, pure action word. He did it, pure action word, used as main verb in both these sentences. I have done the work, here also done. This is the past participle form of the verb do, which is an action word. And as I said, that action word needs to be termed as main verb. So here done is the main verb and any other verb used with this becomes the auxiliary, therefore have is auxiliary. So in all the three sentences, do is used as the main verb. When do appears as the main verb in a sentence, it is bound to be an action word. We can conclude like this. If do has been used as the main verb in a sentence, it is bound to be action word. But see this sentence, I say he went there past form of the verb go. But suppose we want to convey this into negative, we want to make a negative of it. So obviously the sentence that we would write is, he did not go there. Now here we have used the action word go and action word becomes the main verb, therefore go is the main verb and did. This is the past form of do. Now here this has been used as auxiliary because in a given clause there can be a single main verb, okay, you cannot say that there are more than one main verbs, no. 
more than one auxiliaries yes but main verb only one. the moment a form of do has been used as auxiliary this is where this falls into the category of be why because please mark this sentence if you can write it down somewhere only be verbs can become auxiliaries in a sentence okay apart from the original forms of be the other verbs used as auxiliaries in a sentence are shall will have and modal verbs no action word is permitted to be used as auxiliary but there is one exception that is do do is an action word that has been permitted to be used as an auxiliary and since we define that uh, only be verbs have the ability to become auxiliaries and therefore by this virtue when do becomes an auxiliary this is said to fall into the category of be for this particular sentence in this particular case not all which similarly if we make an interrogative sentence out of this then the question would be did he go there in yes no questions before the subject we need to use a verb and that needs to be a be verb that cannot be an action word so the verbs that can appear before the subject in any interrogative sentence or in yes no question the verbs are the forms of be have shall will modal verbs and one action word is permitted that is do and therefore do here is not in the role of action word here go is the main verb and this is in the role of auxiliary and the moment this is in the role of auxiliary so here by default it is said to belong to the category of b only in this particular case this much clear so we started with a simple sentence and we have reached here what is the point that we were talking that the very first thing we have to mark in a given sentence is the verb and that particular term verb made us travel this distance okay now the next point what is the role of the verb in a sentence what is the role of the verb in a sentence why is verb important in a sentence why is verb important let's see let me write down a sentence The sentence written on the board is boys play hockey in the college ground every evening. Boys play hockey in the college ground every evening. Now see in this sentence we have used a verb play which is an action word and therefore it is the main verb and we have used the single verb. Now in this particular sentence our intention is to say something about this noun word boys our intention is to say something about this noun word boys and the role of the verb in a sentence is you can write it down that verb says something about the subject now listen the moment we need to utter a sentence the moment we need to utter a sentence why do we need to speak out a sentence or write a sentence because we want to say something now that something would be regarding 
someone or something. That means we would be talking about some object or some person. Right? And the moment we want to give any kind of information about anything or any person, that work is to be done by the verb. And that is why the statement verb says something about the subject. Or other way around we can say, that let's look for the word about which the verb says something and that word would be the subject. Both the ways, verb says something about the subject or the other way around, the word, the object or person about whom the verb gives any kind of information, that is the subject. Very important term. You all have heard this term subject, object, but here we need to understand in detail what a subject is and later we will come to what an object is. So verb says something about the subject. So here our intention is to talk about boys. We want to part with certain information about this noun word boys and about this noun word boys we have said several things. One is the action that is taking place that then we are um, another type of information uh, we have given and that is the name of the game. Then we have named the place and then we have named the time also. So this much information about the noun word boys. Now, suppose if we do not want to give this information, this piece of information, then also the sentence would exist. Then the sentence would be boys play hockey in the college ground. Now, suppose if we do not want to give this piece of information also that is in the college ground, then also the sentence would exist and it would say that boys play hockey. Suppose even if we do not want to name the game, then also the sentence would survive. That means we have not talked much about the noun word boys. We have only given a single piece of information that what is it that boys do, the boys play. Now out of these three pieces of information, it's your discretion whether you want to mention this or not, whether you want to mention this or not and whether you want to mention this or not. You could have written the sentence as boys play every evening. You could have written boys play hockey every evening. You could have written boys play in the college ground. Anyway, but you can remove any of these or all of these but the moment you remove this particular word boy, we won't be in a position, sorry, the moment we remove this particular word play, we won't be in a position at all to say something, anything about the boys. We cannot part with any type of information. So it is this particular word that helps us inform about this noun word. And that is why without a verb, a sentence cannot survive. The moment you drop this word, the sentence collapses. And since this verb word play, this gives information about this noun word boys and therefore this noun word boys is termed as the subject. So verb says something about the subject or the other way around, the verb word about the object or the person that the verb word informs about that is the subject. So this is how we recognize the subject in a sentence. Now broadly we divide a sentence into two parts about whom the object or person about whom we are talking that is the subject and whatever is talked about the subject, that particular part of the sentence is termed as predicate.
and as you can see here in this sentence that verb falls in the predicate part and this predicate part cannot sustain without this verb. If the verb is gone, the predicate collapses. That means we can say that predicate part must contain a verb. Predicate part must contain a verb. Now, it is not necessary that it would always be an action word. It can be a be verb even. For example, if I say, Hari is intelligent. Now, here we have used this be verb alone as the verb and therefore, it is the main verb. It is to be termed as the main verb. Now, normally we say regarding an action word, ki the person or object that does the action is the subject. Doer of the action is the subject. Usually we say this, but not necessarily. It is not always true that doer of the action is the subject. For example, if I write a sentence that a letter is written by Hari, Now see in this sentence, who is the doer of the action? It is Hari. The doer of the action is Hari. But Hari cannot be the subject. Because by is a preposition and any noun or pronoun appearing after a preposition is termed as the object of that preposition. So, if we happen to say that in a sentence the doer of the action is the subject, that would be incorrect. It is not always the doer of the action. Now, the real problem comes. Then how to recognize the subject? How to recognize the subject? Now, to recognize the subject, if there is a be verb in a sentence, first we should identify the subject with the help of the be verb. For example, let us see in this sentence, Hari is intelligent. Now, this is a be verb, this is, is a be verb. This establishes the existence of Hari. And when this particular word has established the existence of this particular noun, then only we can say anything remaining about that person or that particular thing. So, this be verb is Hari is. This establishes the existence of Hari. Then only we can say anything further about this particular person. So, a be verb establishes the existence of the subject, be it in the present or be it in the past. Or other way around, the existence of a person or thing that is established by a be verb, that person or thing is the subject. And therefore, in this particular sentence, this noun word, hurry is the subject. Now, so also here, because we have ruled out the statement that doer of the action is the subject. We have ruled this out. We are not going to define subject this way, that doer of the action is the subject. Because here that particular rule is defined. Clear? So, now the question arises. So, in such sentences, how to go about searching the subject? So, I said. If there is a be verb in a sentence, then 
try to find the subject with the help of the be verb and how to find the subject with the help of a be verb be verb establishes the existence of the subject now in this particular sentence we have used a be verb that is is so is is auxiliary here and written is main verb now we have a be verb and this be verb establishes the existence of this noun word letter that a letter is and then the rest of the things is being told about this letter. So since this be verb establishes the existence of this particular uh, thing letter and therefore this letter is the subject. So if there is a be verb in a sentence then try to establish the subject with the help of the be verb and not the action word. And if there is no be verb in the sentence, that itself means that action word alone appears as a verb. Right? Because there can be only two conditions. Either there is a be verb or there is no be verb. If there is a be verb, then again two condition arises. Either the be verb is alone or the be verb is accompanied by some action word. Only these two conditions. And if there is no be verb in a sentence, that itself means that action word alone appears as the verb in a sentence. And when the action word alone appears as the verb in a sentence, there we can say the doer of the action is the subject. So we can conclude if an action word appears alone as the verb in a sentence then the subject is the doer of the action. If an action word appears alone as the verb in a sentence, then the subject is the doer of the action. Not always. Under what condition? If an action word appears alone as the verb in a sentence, then subject is the doer of the action. Otherwise, no. Otherwise, we will have to check out. If there is any be verb, then we have to check out the subject with the help of that be verb. Now, let's compare two sentences. One I write, Hari is writing a letter. And another sentence we write, a letter is written by Hari. One is Hari is writing a letter, another is a letter is written by Hari. In both these sentences, we have be verb, and therefore, to determine the subject. We need the help of the be verb and here this be verb establishes the existence of this noun word hurry and therefore here hurry is the subject. But in this sentence, this be verb establishes the existence of this letter and therefore here in this sentence letter is the subject. Now what do we see that in this sentence subject does the action and in this sentence what we see action is done
to the subject. So, in this sentence we see that action is done by the subject and in this sentence we see that action is done to the subject. Now, here we reach one more conclusion and that is the moment subject does the action, the voice of the verb is termed as active. When the action is done by the subject, then the verb is in the active voice for sure. And when the action is done to the subject, then for sure the verb is in passive voice. This is how the name of the voice. Okay, when subject is active, that means the voice of the verb is active when the subject is not active that means the voice of the verb is passive this is how the name active voice and passive voice clear see might seem confusing but please be attentive keep your eyes open keep your mind working because intentionally i am going a bit slow so that you are in a position to comprehend everything because I do not just have to finish off because finishing that will not demand much time. You will not be in a position to know what are the true things that you need to study in grammar. So this is how the voice has been named when the subject is the doer of the action then the voice of the verb is termed as active. When the subject is not the doer of the action, when action is done to the subject, that means the voice of the verb is passive. And in such sentences, this doer of the action becomes the object of preposition and it is not the subject. This becomes object of preposition and this is not the subject. So, you keep studying subject, 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 but in true sense, what is the role of the subject? How to properly recognize a subject? See how the action done by the subject or action done to the subject makes all the difference where the different voice has been named that is active voice and passive voice of the verb, right? So, this is how we recognize the subject. Now, we are going to discuss another very important point. Okay, ready for this? Now, and that important statement is that subject is always a noun or a pronoun. Very important statement. 
ہیں سبجیکٹ از آلویز اناؤن اور اپ ٹو ناؤ ناؤ لیٹس سی دا امپورٹینس آف دس اسٹیٹمنٹ ہاؤ امپورٹینٹ دس اسٹیٹمنٹ از دیٹ از سبجیکٹ از آلویز اناؤن اور اپ ٹو ناؤ Hari writes a letter. Hari subject and this is a noun word. He writes a letter. He is the subject and this is a pronoun word. So subject is always a noun or a pronoun. Very simple. Now let's see one more sentence. See this sentence, walking is good for health. Walking is good for health. We have a verb here, is and this is the main verb. We have a verb is and this is the main verb in this sentence. Why? Because this alone appears as a verb. There is no action word to perform the role of the main verb and therefore this be verb is the main verb. Right? Now, we have recognized the verb. Now we have to do the next thing. With the help of the verb, we need to recognize the subject. And just now we talked about this. How to recognize the subject? Verb says something about the subject. And here we have a V-B verb. And this B verb establishes the existence of this word walking. This verb is establishes, walking is, first establishes the existence of this word walking. Now here, walking cannot be a verb, right? Why? Because the existence of walking is being established by this verb is and since this verb is establishes the existence of this word walking and therefore walking would be termed as subject. You might have a bit confusion taking this as subject. But suppose, now had we written medicine is good for health, would you have any problem taking medicine as subject? I think no. Why? Because medicine is a proper noun word. So you, you won't have any problem taking medicine as the subject. But there seems to be a bit of a problem taking this word walking as the subject. Why? This is equivalent. If we write medicine is good for health, here age establishes the existence of medicine. Similarly, when we write walking is good for health, age establishes the existence of walking and therefore walking is subject. And what did we say? Subject is always a noun or a pronoun means by that virtue, this is to be termed as noun. Though walking basically is a category of the verb class. Walking is basically a word belonging to the category of the verb. But in this sentence, walking has not been used as a verb. Why? Because this becomes subject of the verb is. And the moment it becomes the subject, by the virtue of the above statement, that subject is always a noun or a pronoun, 
we have to call it a noun. It cannot be a pronoun because pronoun words are limited and we will talk about all the pronoun words and their proper use. And therefore, we are left with only one choice that walking is to be termed as noun here in this particular sentence. Now see, walking is not a pure noun word, right? Walking is originally a word belonging to the category of verb, but by virtue of becoming subject in this particular sentence, this plays the role of a noun. That means it has a mixed character of verb and noun. And therefore, this is termed as a verb noun. Since it is not a pure noun, basically this word belongs to the class of verb which has been used as subject that means given the place of noun. Therefore, this is termed as a verb noun. Right? Let's see another sentence. To eat is to live. To eat is to live. Now here also eat cannot be a verb because we have this verb is and we know that any action word in the present form cannot appear as a verb with any be verb. The moment there is a be verb, the action word needs to change its form to become a verb. Because action word in the present form, please mark these statements, they are very important. Action word as a verb in a sentence cannot be used in the present form with any other be verb. But here we have a be verb that means this action word is not a verb as walking is not a verb there. So here is this verb establishes the existence of this particular term to eat and therefore, this becomes the subject. And since subject is always a noun or pronoun, so by this virtue, this is to be termed as a noun. Now, here also what do we see? Eat is not a pure noun word. Eat is basically a verb word. So, this is a verb word, but in this sentence, adjoined with two, this plays as it becomes the subject that means this plays the role of a noun and therefore it is termed as a verb noun. It is termed as a verb noun. Now this is also a verb noun and this is also a verb noun but the forms are different. So now specifically if we want to talk about this form or we want to talk about this form, having a common name would be confusing because if I simply say a verb noun, then either this form can come to your mind or this form can come to your mind. Any of these two, right? And therefore we give them different names. So, verb noun means when verb word is used as a noun in the present participle form or in the ing form, this has been named as zerend. When a verb word is used as a noun in its present participle form or ing form, it is termed as a zerend. We have just given it a new name. It is a verb noun. This is also a verb noun. Just to differentiate the two, we have given different names. And when a verb word in the present form, with the help of two, it becomes subject, that is, plays the role of a noun, this has been termed as infinitive. So, both are verb noun. 
both are verb noun right so if it is a verb noun in present participle form the name given is zerin and if it is a verb noun in the present form preceded by two it is named as infinitive now don't be under any confusion that okay that is fine but what is a zero end what is an infinitive very clearly we are defining what is a zero end and what is an infinitive and all these are derived from that particular recognition of subject that verb says something about the subject so all these statements how they are interlinked verb says something about the subject that way we decipher the subject then comes the statement subject is always a noun or a pronoun means by virtue of becoming the subject it has to be termed as noun whether it is a be verb or what so even a be verb when it becomes the subject it has been termed as a noun and such noun has been named as zero and if the verb word in the present form preceded by two if it becomes the subject is by virtue of becoming subject it is playing the role of a noun and therefore a new name given to it is infinitive clear this much very simple to understand infinitive and zero now let's have a look at two more sentences a rolling stone gathers no moss a rolling stone gathers no moss and a birth child dreads the fire a burnt child dreads the fire a rolling stone gathers no moss let's analyze this sentence a rolling stone gathers see rolling cannot be verb here though roll is a verb category word we have added ing that means we have made its present participle form but in this particular sentence this is not in the role of a verb why because any action word in ing form to appear as a verb in a sentence it must be preceded by a be verb when we say the stone is rolling now rolling can be a verb there to show the continuous tense form why because there it is preceded by a be verb is but here this is not preceded by any be verb and therefore in ing form an action word cannot play the role of a verb alone clear very important statements an action word in ing form alone cannot play the role of a verb in a sentence it must must be preceded by a be verb to become a verb and therefore rolling here is not a verb and gathers is the verb gather is to collect clear now here in this sentence we have a single action word as the verb and remember the statement that we talked about if action word alone appears as verb in the sentence then doer of the action is the subject remember now these are quite interrelated that is why time and again i say please focus please be attentive it is highly conceptual nothing to mug up yes you have to keep those master statements in mind i know you might not have studied grammar in this way 
okay, might seem a bit difficult, but it is not. Ease your mind and make your mind prepared that actually this is the true way that we have to learn grammar, not by mugging up rules. See how conceptual the things are. So when a single action word, when action word alone appears as verb in a sentence, then subject is the doer of the action. And who is the doer of the action? Stone. Who is doing the work of gathering? Who is doing the work of collecting? Stone. Collecting or not collecting? That is the work of the stone. And therefore, this noun word stone is the subject. Clear? Now, what is this word rolling? This is not a verb. We talked about this. It is not a verb. Then what is it? This is a big question. Let's see what is it. Nothing special. A hard stone. A soft stone. A slippery stone. Had we used instead of rolling, had we used these words, what would be they? Adjective. Any word that gives any additional information about a noun or a pronoun is called an adjective. Please remember, we will talk about it later, but for the time being. Any word that gives any additional information about a noun or a pronoun is termed as adjective. And therefore, had we used these words hard or soft, they would be adjectives. Similarly, as we are talking about the texture that is hard or soft, similarly here by using this word rolling, we are talking about the state of the stone. For example, instead of rolling, if we write stationary, there won't be any problem taking stationary as adjective, stationary stone. And if stationary shows the state of this noun word stone, therefore it is adjective then why not moving? Opposite of stationary. If we write a moving stone, so obviously as stationary is objective, similarly moving would be adjective. And that is how by defining the state of this noun word stone, rolling becomes adjective. But is rolling a pure adjective? No. Actually, this word originally belongs to the class of verb. Getting my point? This is not a pure adjective. Hard, soft, stationary would be pure adjectives. But moving, rolling, they won't be pure adjectives. Why? Because these words, they originally belong to the class of verbs. That means, here is a verb word that has been used as adjective. It has not been used as verb. In this sentence, we have used a verb word as adjective. And when a verb word is used as adjective, we give it a new name and that is participle. When a verb word is used as adjective in a sentence, then it is given a new name. It can be called as verb adjective. But instead of saying verb adjective, we give it a new name and that name is participle. So by hearing the word participle, what should come to your mind? 
it should strike your mind that if he says participle that means it is an adjective but not original adjective verb word in the role of adjective clear so that is what is termed as participle now let's come to this sentence a burnt child dreads the fire see dreads the fire here dreads has been used as verb and when uh, action word alone that means without the help of any be verb when action word alone that means without the help of any be verb is used as verb in a sentence then remember try to recollect the statement that then the doer of the action is the subject can you recollect it that when action word alone appears as a verb in a sentence then doer of the action who is afraid who is doing the work of dreading child and therefore this noun word child is the subject now let's define this word burnt instead of burnt we write a small child what would be the role of this word small if we write a small child if we write a small child, what would be the role of the word small? Of course, adjective. Why? Because this word small adds information to the noun word child. Means what kind of child is? Small child. And therefore, this is adjective. Now, as small shows, as an adjective, as small shows the size of the child, Similarly, this word burnt shows the state of the child and therefore this is adjective. And burn is originally a verb word which has been used as an adjective in this sentence. That means here also this burnt is a verb word used as adjective. And when a verb word is used as adjective, this is named as participle as we talked about here. So, to differentiate such adjective from original adjectives, we give them new names. So, when a verb word is used as an adjective in a sentence, a new name is given to it and that name is participle. Don't get confused. What is a participle? We are defining in very simple terms what a participle is. That adjective to qualify a noun, an adjective, it can be a pure adjective or it can be some other category word. And if it is a verb category word, qualifying a noun means doing the work of an adjective. Then a new name, it acquires a new name and that name is participle. Now, similarly, just see, if I am taking your class, I am a teacher, okay, I go to Himalayas, okay, I wear that saffron and all that and with that lumbar choti and long flowing beards and all that, okay, and I am living in the jungles of Himalayas, I am not living in the, with the mankind anymore. What would you call me? A teacher or a saint? Then I would become a saint. The name is changed. Right? Simple. So it's that simple. Now this is also participle. This is also participle. But the verb forms are different. Here we have used the ing form. Here we have used the past form. So here when we say a rolling stone gathers no moss, that means it shows the state of the stone during the time we talk. And what is the state? The action continues. Right? That means here it is in the present and therefore this is termed as present participle. And here child is not burning. Had we written a burning train? A burning train 
that means this shows the present state of the train that it's still burning action continues so here it is present form that means here it would be termed as present participle but here a burnt child means the action is over here the action continues, the stone is rolling. Here the action is over, finished. And therefore this has become past. So this shows the present state, therefore present participle. And this shows the past state, therefore past participle. Right? Now, go back to the forms of the verb. So now if I ask you, what are the pure forms of the verb? How many forms are there? Obviously there are four, present, past, past participle and present participle. Now my question changes, what are the pure forms of the verb? So pure forms are only present and past. Because the moment we say past participle, then come back here. What is a past participle? Past participle is verb in the role of adjective. Verb in the role of adjective. That is past participle. So can a past participle be pure verb? No. Very simple. Similarly, present participle, the fourth form of the verb is present participle. Present participle, can it be a pure form of the verb? No. Look there. Present participle itself means that it is verb in the role of adjective. So that is how the names of the forms of the verb, present participle and past participle. So only two forms of, of the verb are pure forms that is present and past. Past participle and present participle forms, they are not the pure forms. Okay. So now, here we saw that a verb word not necessarily is used as verb in a sentence. Here we have seen that a verb word is not necessarily always used as a verb in a sentence. It can get into other roles also. Clear? Summarizing whatever we have been talking about, that is what I am summarizing now. That a verb word in a sentence, it can appear in the role of a verb or it can appear in other roles also. So based on what type of role a verb word is in. Now, based on that, we would be going for another division. One category is finite verb. Finite verb is verb word used as verb in a sentence. Finite verb is verb word used as verb in a sentence, then it is finite. But at the same time, a verb word may be used in other role also. There we name it as non-finite. Here we name it as non-finite verb. non-finite verb. That means though it is a verb category word but in the sentence it is not used as a verb. So let's define it. Verb word used as. Now what are the two categories that we used these verb words into? In the earlier two sentences you saw walking is good for health and to eat is to live. 
there the verb word got into the role of noun that means verb word used as noun or in the two sentences a rolling stone gathers no moss and a burnt child dreads the fire verb word got into the role of adjective so verb word used as noun or adjective in a sentence verb word used as noun or adjective in a sentence that is termed as non finite verb and in how many ways the verb word can be used as noun in the two forms we named one as zirand and we named the other as infinitive not difficult how how we are proceeding from very simple terms and simple uh, concepts into the confusing terms and complex ideas and this journey is necessary for this transition then nothing is difficult only it should be a smooth transition suppose one fine morning one day i come to your class and i start or oh, today we will talk about participle see this is participle this is participle this is participle you will keep on wondering what what the hell is this okay so that is why i am trying to discuss right from the very beginning to build up your concept and this way we can master the most complex ideas so as noun we used it as zirand or infinitive and as adjective this is termed as participle and here also there are two forms it can be present participle or as an adjective it can be past participle right so today we talked about verb that verb is the most important word in a sentence therefore first we need to point out the verb how to mark the verb we talked about that action word and be verbs and what are the different types different forms we discussed all those then we talked about the different uses of the verb have how it carries different meaning then we talked about the verb do where it is an action word and where it falls into the category of be and why we talked in detail then we came to the subject what is the role of a verb it appears in a sentence to say something about the subject that means the verb defines the subject and that way we went on to recognize the subject in a sentence and we talked a lot of things okay even voice crept in that if subject does the action then the verb, voice of the verb is active and if action is done to the subject then the voice of the verb is passive if you have taken down the notes please go through them it's very important and if this concept is built then nothing remains difficult it would be a cake walk for you as well as for me also okay because if you do not get my ideas then it's futile okay staying in front of you so uh, then we talked about the subject and talking about the subject we came on to the two categories of verb that is finite and non finite and we talked about that in the non finite form a verb can be used as a noun or adjective as a noun it can be a zirand or an infinitive and an adjective it can be present participle or past participle right in the next class we will talk about object today we talked about the subject in the next class we will talk about the object which is again very important okay that's all for today have a good day we meet again thank you